Well, uh, can you take me down just a little bit? I'm a little more thunderous than my father. <laughs> Try to throttle it back. I'll be. It says the meek shall inherit the earth, so I'll be like, Hey guys, let's talk about Revelation. No. Um, so I started this message a few weeks ago where I talked about the seven churches and I talked about John. Um, so I'm going to briefly kind of recap those things because there's some new faces and I don't want you to be completely lost. But when we study Revelations, I'm going to kind of start with the big rocks, right? So we talked about the churches already. We're going to talk about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, which are extremely important. We're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ, right, which is when all men stand before God or Jesus and are judged based on the life that they've lived in and either step into eternity or not. Um, and so those are kind of the big rocks. So I may skip through some chapters, and there's a lot in there. If you have questions, you can see me afterwards. We can always meet up and talk about some of those things. Um, but there's just a lot in Revelation to go through. And I want to make sure that I get all the big things hit first. So um, just to kind of go through, recap, the reason why we go through, um, I want to kind of recap is because I want to touch on, because we're going to talk about the seals today, I need to talk about um, what exactly the seals are on and why that is significant. Um, so to do that, Tiffany, if you can move it forward two slides, I think. Well, it's because you clicked off the presentation mode. Are you multitasking? Because if you're... I don't believe her. You clicked off of that presentation mode. Okay. All right. So in order to talk about Revelation, we have to start all the way back at the beginning, which is really amazing and ironic and beautiful that, that the scriptures were written in this way, considering they were written hundreds and thousands of years apart and yet still have all this connectivity in them. But you start off in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. You don't have to turn there, but you can write it down. God created, he created the heavens and the earth, right? He goes through creating all the animals and the plant life and everything like that. And he creates man in his own image. And then in verse 27, he says, He created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. And he blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl, the air, and every living creature on the earth. So God creates this wonderful uh, utopia, basically, in the Garden of Eden. And he creates, the earth was already there. It was dark and void. It's not like the earth was created at that moment. Everything on the earth was created in that moment. And so God then says, I'm giving you this gift. I'm giving you the earth. And he hands it over to man. Okay? That's what the scripture is telling us. He's telling you, I'm giving you dominion, subdue it and everything. This is before Adam fell. So he gives it to him, right? Then we all know the story. Man falls. It's woman's fault, right? <laughs> Nobody else raised their hand but me. My wife's in nursery, so I was a little more brave than the most. Um, I felt liberty to do that. I understand, brother. Keep that hand down. Happy wife, happy life. Um, so man falls, the earth goes through multiple changes, multiple civilizations. Um, you have the flood, you have things where God has to come and judge because mankind is just really making a mess of things. Now, God does, never, does not ever violate our free will. He doesn't. Sometimes people get in this argument over and over again about, well, if God knows everything that's going to happen, then there is no free will. And that's absolutely wrong. Just because I know something's going to happen doesn't mean I influenced or impacted that in any way. You still have the choice to do it. How many of y'all have loved ones who go down the wrong path or do somewhat um, unintelligent things that get them in trouble? And you, having experience, would point at them and say, if you go down this road, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get hurt. Your loved ones are going to get hurt. It's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you a lot of time and heartache. And they still do it. Did they have free will? Yeah. God is the same way. Just because God knows the end from the beginning, he knows everything that's going to happen, no matter what, doesn't mean that you don't have free will. You still get to choose. So, so man screws up the world pretty bad. God can't just say, all right, backsies, that was just a test. You failed and take it back. He's not a God that he would do that. Romans 11:29 says, for God's gifts and his call cannot be withdrawn. So it can never be withdrawn in some uh, in some different uh, versions of the Bible. The whole point is God can't take it back. He gave it already. Okay? 
So the whole point is we need somebody who can inherit this earth. Is anybody in this room worthy? Not yet. At this time, no. Scott, close. I love the boldness. He like he started and he checked around and was like, nobody else is raising their hand, so he's going to call it quick. I thought that was a shoulder twitch. I didn't know that was your hand. Um, no, so at this time, the world's all messed up, and God just can't take it back. And so Jesus, being a loving son to God, says, I'll do it. I'll give up godhood. I will cease to be God, because there's God, right? God, the Son, the Holy Spirit. There's a triune being. They, were, they could be everywhere at once. They were, they were the Trinity, right? That's what Satan wanted in on in the beginning. They were the Trinity. And Jesus says, I'll give it up. And it's not like he just gave it up for the 33 years of his life and then died and then suddenly became God again. He can't become God until he inherits the earth. A man has the title deed to earth. When God gave it to man, it's in man's hands, which means Jesus right now is still a man. He's got a glorified body in heaven, and he is with his Father, but he is still a man. And I think that's important that we kind of draw that distinction and recognize the fact that Jesus gave up all that power, all that ability, all that knowledge, all that everything, and became something as insignificant as we feel as man. But see, Jesus knew how God felt about man. He knew that God loved man so much and that he wanted to redeem them, that he wanted them to have life and purpose. And so then he goes and says, Father, I'll, I'll do it. I'll live the perfect life, which is what Adam should have done. That's why a lot of times in Scripture he's referred to as the second Adam, right? He's the Adam that doesn't make the mistake, that doesn't fall to sin. Was he tempted? Absolutely. He was a man. He was a man. He was tempted and tried, just like everybody else. But he had to walk that out. And he did it because he loved his father so much. He loved us, but he loved us because God loved us first. And that's kind of the beautiful relationship you have. So, so you see that in Hebrews 2.14, God says, Much as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same. Um, he had to live a perfect life like Adam. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found within his mouth. When he died, he was the only one who had lived a completely spotless life. And this is my, one of my favorite scriptures, John 18.37. Pilate therefore said to him, Jesus, are you a king then? And I love the way Jesus answers. He says, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come to the world that I should bear witness to the truth. In that moment, he revealed something to Pilate that he himself didn't fully understand. And it's that Jesus is king. He is worthy and he has the right to take back the earth. It's his right. He just hasn't taken it fully yet. So everyone clear on that? All right. Perfect. So you can see a scroll up there, but when we get to Revelations, we'll read through it. The whole point is the seals that we talk about, the seven seals, are actual seals. And those seals are on the book that contains the ownership and the title deed to earth. When you buy a car, do you get a title? Right? A little piece of paper that says, I own it. When you buy a house, and it's, I mean, obviously there's a loan on there until you pay it off. <laughs> it's mostly yours. Um, but when you buy a house, same thing, right? That piece of paper proves. That means that 500 years from now, if someone came to take your land, you'd be able to say, no, this piece of paper here says I own it. I've owned it since whenever. That's how property gets passed down generation to generation. So in that same way, sometimes we think of the things of God and we think of heaven as like this spiritual thing when there are still natural things that occur. There's still a title deed to earth. Because Satan, man, he loves to try to come up and pick a fight in court. And you know God keeps good records. He goes, no, nah, let me just open this up. Yep, still, still Jesus. He still owns it. When Satan tries to say, I got the whole world messed up. And he did at one time. So that, that kind of gets us to where we're at. Um, that, that's why I wanted you to understand that before we get into the seals. But um, Revelation was written at about 95 A.D. Um, 
John was probably 70-ish on the Isle of Patmos. And he was exiled because he was uh, going to be boiled in oil, and he didn't boil. And all that did was inflame Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. And so the Caesar at the time was really ticked off, and he was like, well, I'm just going to send him on an island, so that way he can't talk to anybody, and maybe this Christianity thing will kind of put itself out. <laughs> didn't work. So John is on the Isle, and he was exiled, and he was literally, Isle of Patmos was just a giant, it was like a small island um, off the Mediterranean, where they would send people to break rocks. That was pretty much all you did all day, was just breaking rocks. Those rocks would eventually go on a boat, and then that boat would take all the, like, the quartz and stuff like that out. Um, so he was basically at a rock quarry, pretty terrible at the end of his life. He's thinking his career is over. He has been a disciple of Christ. He's lived a wonderful life. He's preached in many churches. He's written multiple books. He's thinking it's time for retirement. And then just like that, you know, an angel of the Lord shows up and says, no, you're not done. I got one more thing for you to do. So if you go through chapter 1 of Revelation, which I already covered, is basically the angel appearing before John. And John is just writing this book saying, here's why I'm writing it. I have to tell you the things to come. An angel came to me and said, these things you must write down because they're going to happen. And I need you to make sure that all the churches know and that forever these words are settled so that everyone has like a reference to look back. People who think the revelations can't be understood have never actually spent time in it. And there's, there's some people who believe that uh, the book of Revelations is all symbolic. The problem is it's referenced multiple times, and we're going to get to it. Christ talks about Revelation while he's alive with his disciples. It's not some metaphoric, symbolic thing, but sometimes people make it out to be that way. That is one denomination that basically believe one sector of people that believe that Revelations is all just interpretive, like it's all just like a, like a, like a sonnet or a poem and that it has no significance. How do you know that's a great lie of the enemy? It takes the most powerful, most important book for any generation, the roadmap to the return of Christ, and says, ah, it's just poetry. It's all symbolism wrapped up in, you know, an allegory and, you know, morphed into something that's not. Some people believe that it's already taken place. I hate to break it to you. Jesus is not here. The world is still pretty messed up. If it's already taken place, then uh, I don't know who's on the throne, but it ain't Jesus. Um, <clears throat> so as we go through it, really think about the applicability of this. And some things I'm going to say, you're going to go, Kevin, there's no way that could really happen. Kevin, there's no way. That sounds like science fiction. That sounds just completely out there. Well, where do you think science fiction got its inspiration? <laughs> no. Right? It had to come from somewhere. We're not that great with our imagination, right? There are certain things, like when you watch Lord of the Rings or you watch certain movies and good versus evil, there's things and you see magic and you see power and all this stuff. All of that comes from this deep aching within our bodies that say we're meant for something more. We have power and we have the Spirit of God that lives within us or can live within us. Even if you're not saved, you have that aching in your heart. That's why, that's why people chase the American dream. And they chase success because they're trying to fill this hole in their heart, in, their, in, their, in their, themselves, that says, I should be doing something with my life. I should be important, right? Mm -hmm. So as I go through them, keep an open mind. Know that these things are going to happen. And also know that it's all in historical context. John didn't know what some of these things were, so he described them the way he could back in 95 AD, right? So he's going to say a lot of things like, it was like unto, or I saw like this. He's comparing it to something because he doesn't know what else to compare it to, right? We call flashlights flashlights, but a long time ago they were called torches. They were called torches even after there were flashlights. They were just so used to calling them torches, they used to call them torches. I think they still do in, in England. They've got to catch up. They're, they're flashlights, all right? Um... <laughs> No, but, but, but when you read through, and that's the other reason why you can never just like, okay, read the scripture, blah, 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 and he said this, and they went there, and that was the end of it. There's so much more underneath that if you look at the Greek or the Hebrew of why that word was chosen and what it's trying to tell you, it's way more than King James ever thought it was. 
he took Greek and Hebrew and just tried to slap it over. And they con- when they converted over to Latin, they're like, we don't even have some of the words that they're using. Some of the words they have have like six different definitions. And it depends on when you're saying it and who you're saying it to. And so to think that you could just read a scripture one time and be like, boom, I know exactly what he's trying to say, you'd be fooling yourself. There's so much that goes into it. So um, I'm not going to go through Revelation chapter 4. It's on the next slide, but I'll just kind of briefly cover it. John just finished hearing the messages to the church. There were seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And if you want to learn about them, they're on YouTube, because I already taught about them a few weeks ago. All right? But he wrote those letters to those churches. And then right after you go into Revelation 4, John says, I see a door open in heaven, and a voice calls me up. So he gets taken to heaven. Right? He gets to see God. He sees the throne. He describes the throne. If you read chapter 4, you'll see it. He sees the throne room of God. And he gets to witness everyone worshiping God as the creator of the world. So I'm not going super far into that, but I just wanted you to know why, what it was and why I'm skipping forward. So the only thing I want you to get from chapter 4 is verse 8. It says, four living creatures, each of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they did not cease to say, and then they go through what their worship song was. What I want you to hold on to is day and night they did not cease. Heaven is always filled with noise. It's always filled with worship. There's always something going on. One of the seals, something happens in heaven that's extremely significant. So I want you to just hold on to that nugget. But we are going to go to Revelation chapter 5, because this right here goes right into, and I don't know if I have it on there, Tiffany, I apologize. I'm kind of improv it a little bit more than I thought I would. Okay, so Revelation chapter 5, John is in heaven, he says, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. So here it is the title deed to earth, right? This is the ownership right here, and it's sealed up. Why is it sealed? Anybody? That's it. I can't go and just be like, oh, Ryan, you're my, that's my car now. No, his name's on the title deed. He's the only one that has the right to do it, right? Now, naturally, I could go steal his keys and take his car. It's a Prius, so it wouldn't get away very fast. He could probably, like, jog alongside and be like, give me my car back. <laughs> Meanie. Um... So it's sealed up with seven seals, and only, like Carlos said, only the person who has the right to open it can open it and then declare it's mine. You can buy a car without actually taking ownership of it. You buy a car at a dealership, it sits there. Until you go pick it up and you sign off on the paper, and then it becomes yours. You have the right to it, it, it is there, but you haven't taken possession of it yet. That's the same way right here in Revelations. The, John is seeing basically the beginning of the end where this book is sitting there unopened. Verse 2 says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, the dead, was able to open the book or even look in it. Even God Almighty, who created the earth, would not open the book. It's not his anymore. He gave it. Then John says, Then I began to weep greatly. That word greatly, we're going to see it quite a few times. In that connotation, it's actually talking about terribly. Like he was a blubbering idiot, just weeping on the floor. Because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And then one of the elders, you'll, you, the elders were in chapter 4, there's elders around the throne of God, said, Stop weeping and behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. He overcame so he could open the book and the seven seals. And I saw between the throne and the elders a lamb standing. That word lamb is just describing this spotless, pure, just like lambs were for slaughter back in those days. You would take this spotless, pure thing, undefiled, and that was used for your sacrifice to atone for your sins. So it uses the word lamb, but it's 
talking about Christ. Again, he's describing and using the language he could that he understood at that time. So he sees Christ standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes and seven spirits of God sent out all over the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of God. So it's sitting there in the right hand of God and, and, the, right, and the angel is saying, who's worthy? And then Jesus comes from amongst the crowd and says, I can do it. I'm worthy and takes the book. And then when he took the book, if you read further, you'll see that the worship changes in heaven. At first it's singing all about God and how great and holy, holy is our God. And that's sung forever, without ceasing. And then the moment Jesus takes the book, the atmosphere in heaven changes. Everyone in heaven knows, oop, something different's about to happen. And they begin to worship the one who took the book. And it even says in verse 9, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God, and with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation are saved. It's exciting. No, it's all good. You can stop it. Um... So the atmosphere changes in heaven. The worship changes in heaven. It all becomes focused on this book and these seals and what's going to happen when they break. All right. So now we can get into it. All right. So as we go through this, I want you to remember these things must take place. It says in the beginning of Revelation, when he comes, these things must take place. Okay? So sometimes people as Christians will see terrible things happen on the earth and they'll start praying against it, right? Now God's not controlling those things. Those are things that are happening on the earth, but some of these things have to happen. And so if you find yourself praying against some of the things that God is saying, no, 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 that's judgment. You know, you can pray for the people, pray for the families, pray for for the situation, but you have to pray. When you pray, God, let your will be done, it becomes his will, not yours. Not your interpretation of his will, not what you think he should have done, none of that, right? All right, so I'm going to go through the Revelation timeline as far as each of the seven things, uh, or the 21 things, because there's seven seals, trumpets, and bowls. Um, and then what it, all I'm going to focus on today, as long as I have time, we may go till next week as well, is the seven seals, all right? And they're listed there, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, the prayers of the saints, the terror, and the silence. Okay? Those are the seals. Every time a seal breaks, you'll see in the following scripture, John will explain what is happening. Either it's heaven or earth. Something is happening when those seals break. Then you have the seven trumpets. Destruction of vegetation, oceans, fresh water, hiding the sun, moon, and stars, dark sky and pestilence, an army from the Euphrates, and then the announcement that Jesus reigns and that he inherits the earth. Now, we all know, we all should know, that last trumpet, we get to join him. That's the last blast. But that's the announcement. So then he goes into the bowls. These bowls, he describes, and we'll get to them, he sees in heaven, are filled with the prayers of the saints. How many of you all have uh, witnessed or seen something wicked and you wished God would judge it? Everyone's hands should go up, right? You've seen, heard, read, something wicked happened, and you prayed, oh, God, I I hope that that family finds peace, and I hope that that person is brought to justice for the things that he did. That prayer goes in that bowl. Okay? When we get to it, I'll go more in detail, but that's what that is. Those bowls get filled by all of our prayers while while we were praying for Jesus, come quickly, Jesus, judge these things, Jesus, turn this situation around. It all fills those bowls, and then those bowls get poured out onto the earth. But then it goes through the plagues. Don't worry. You're not there for that. Okay? We're going to go through them, but you're not there for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It can get scary. But, you know, as I read through it again, I was reminded of the story of Pharaoh, right, and how hard his heart had gotten and how many plagues had to come against Egypt to try to just to get people free. How many plagues had to come and just to break the will of one man in power? 
And I'm reminded of how hard-headed we could be and how sometimes God in His judgment, things happen to shake us and wake us up. But sometimes we're just way too, too asleep. All right. So, Revelation chapter 6 starts right off. This is where we're going to spend the meat of today. Revelation 6, verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb, Christ, broke one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures, which are described in in chapter 4, coming. They're basically narrating for John. They're showing him, here's what you should be focused on. That's another important trend that you see in Revelations, that, that God is always telling you where to look. And he's always telling you what to pay attention to. And so, here are the creatures telling him, hey, look here, come here, I want to show you something. This seal broke, but it's not just a seal, something happened. With a voice said, come. I looked, it says, and I saw, oh here you go, and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. So we're going to break this down just a little bit. So white horse, right, the word white, it was actually like a radiant white, not just like eggshell white that you would see like on paint or something, right? It's like a radiant white, but it was slightly off, right? The way he's describing this white is it's not quite right. It's white and it's bright, but he doesn't compare it in the same way that he compares the white robes in heaven, the same way, the same way he, he describes the white lamb, Jesus Christ, who opens the seal. So right away, we already know that this white, it's not of God. It's slightly off, okay? So the white is replicating holiness, someone emulating Christ, trying to fake it and appear to be holy for people. Now, they use horses a lot, and you can read, like, in Job 39, it talks about horses, but the reason why he, he describes them on this horse is because back in the day, that was like the tank, right? That was like the most powerful force, right? Horses would just tear through an army. If anybody's seen Return of the King, anybody? Raise your hand if you've seen Return of the King. I just want to know I'm not alone. Okay. We've got to get you to watch them. Okay. So uh, in Return of the King, there's this huge orc army and these horses. And this cavalry is huge, but it is vastly outnumbered by these foot soldiers. But when they come riding through, they're just running over enemies, just stomping them to the ground, knocking them over. You know, and then they're up top, so they have the height advantage to be able to hit multiple people. They're faster. So the reason why he's using horses to describe it is he's saying it's this mighty person, this strong person, this force that, was, that just couldn't be stopped, right? And then it says he has a bow. And the way it describes the bow there is it's not a bow, even though in this picture I could not find a good one. I apologize. No, nobody can get it right. Um, how dare they? This bow is described almost as if it was on his back, but he had no quiver, no arrows. What purpose is a bow without arrows? Right? It was symbolic. It was symbolic that he was going to go and he was going to conquer, because it says that he will conquer, go forth conquering and to conquer. He conquers without arrows, but he has a bow. So he threatens war, but he doesn't have to kill people but he still conquers, right? So now you're picturing this person who's emulating Christ, emulating that almost as if he's holy in some type of Messiah, who conquers but doesn't kill anybody, but has the power and can threaten people as if he could. This is the Antichrist. That's what this is describing right now which the Bible makes multiple references to the Antichrist, he's going to come into power. And he's going to come into it because it says a crown was given to him. God didn't give him a crown. Who do you think gave him a crown? Man. This is going to be a person who the whole world is going to look at and be like, look at how great this person is. Look at all the good deeds that he is doing, right? Look at all the, he's feeding the hungry. He's uniting peoples together. This guy's like a, he's like a Messiah. And he's going to be promoted and put forth by the people, by man. They are going to promote him. God's not giving him this power. So as we go through this, make sure you're, you're drawing the distinction. God's not 
in, the Antichrist has his own free will to do his own things. When he pops the seal, it's signifying that this has occurred. So a crown was given to him. So how many of you guys have seen the coexist stickers? Okay. That is a wonderful campaign that tries to push love and acceptance and all of those things. And it is a wonderful work of the enemy. To tell you that Satanism and some of these other religions can be on the same equal footing as the cross. That's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thing. But you can absolutely see how something like that could take the world by storm. We're so politically correct, right? We love people so much we're afraid to tell them the truth. So this Antichrist, I'm not sure how it's going to all work out with him and whether it's coexist, whether it's some other movement. There's meetings happening right now between the Catholic Church and Islam and all these other religions to try to form some type of one world religion. It's going to happen in our lifetime. All these things that we're just like, no way, that's crazy, that's far out. It's going to happen. So many wars on this planet have occurred because of religion. Man would try to fix it. Man would say, I could fix religion. We all just worship the same thing, right? We all just exist, you know what I mean? Like, we can still worship our different deities, but all paths still lead, lead to heaven. That's their way of solving it, right? That way nobody has to kill each other or war over things. So, first deal is the Antichrist, okay? We're going to go over that again because Jesus talks to his disciples about him. And then Revelation chapter 6, verse 3 says, when he broke the second seal, I heard a second creature, so the other one that was there, calling him, saying, come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him sat on it, he was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. So we're going to go through it. Red horse, he uses, the, the word here is red, but actually in the Greek it's describing not like, a blood red, more like a fiery red. Almost like a flaming horse, if you could. Um, it says, power was given to him to take peace. He was allowed by man to take peace. Now you would think, okay, well, how could somebody allow a leader like that to take peace from the earth? Because it's not God. Again, this is not God doing it. This is the earth. This is what's happening on the earth. So everybody here have a guy named Hitler? Did he take peace from the earth? For a long time, he took peace from the earth. So if you read this and you're like, that'll never happen, I'm here to tell you it's already happened before, and that was on a very small scale. There were still parts of the world that weren't impacted by him. This is something that is going to be global. So he was allowed by man to take peace and make war. That's what it says when power was given to him. And it says a great sword... And I used to always read that and think, okay, so he's got like this giant sword that he's like swaying back and forth. But then when you look up the word it, in the Greek, it's uh, 3173 if you want to look it up. It actually is the word megas, where we get mega, obviously. But then below it, where it's, where it's applied here is that word terrible. Just like before when he says, I, was, I, had, I greatly weeped. I was terribly just undone. In the same way, he's saying this is not just some big sword. It's actually depicting a knife or a dagger, something you would use to slaughter. So he's going about making war, and it might not be the most public thing, right? It might be, what, what do you do with a dagger or a knife? You hit vital organs one time, hopefully, and you're done. You're not going to be able to go at it with a guy with a great sword or, you know, a any, any other type of weapon. It is a weapon that's used to stab in the back, to whatever. So this red horse, when it's describing, it's describing another, so this isn't the Antichrist, this is another person who is coming to take peace from the earth. And he's going to do it with strategic killings and assassinations, and he's going to find a way to cause chaos. All right. On to the third seal. Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard another creature saying, Come. And I looked, behold, a black horse. 
And he, he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and wine. All right, so starting first with the black horse. It's not just a color for color's sake. He actually described it almost like ink black, like the ink you would find in like a, like a pen almost, right? And the reason why he was trying to describe it that way, the guy had a pair of scales. What do we use scales for? Weighing two different things, right? Measurement. We use it for justice. Right? That's our symbol of justice. We hear both sides, and then we determine who is at fault and who's not. So here, John is describing this horse that comes through, and it's almost like, like it, if you remember back before when I talked about the lay of the sea and the rights of the people, it's almost like that. This horse is coming, and he's going to just completely disrupt the economy. Right? And it says a court, uh, it says a court of wheat for a denarius. A quart of wheat was basically about as much as it took to feed you for a day. And a denarius was a day's wage. So now imagine where an economy gets so bad, and we've seen places in the world where that's already happened, where the economy is so bad that a day's labor just barely feeds you. And that just feeds you. A quart of wheat is enough for one person. I'm the only one that works in my house. I mean, I'm the only one that has employment. Uh, definitely not the only one that works. I corrected. She came out of nursery, so that's why. <laughs> <clears throat> but if I had to work, and every day that I worked, I could only feed one person, I have a wife and three kids, right? You could see how that could be problematic. Um, and it says, do not damage the oil and wine, or in some uh, versions it says, do not hurt the oil and wine which means it's going to be an injustice. It's going to be the things that you need to survive and food and stuff like that could go up in price. However, like the oil and the wine and things like that maybe won't go up in price. How many know the enemy would love to make beer just super cheap, right? Food, super expensive, beer, super cheap. Provision and things for your family, super expensive. But any type of drugs or anything like that, make those really cheap. It's an imbalance, right? The whole point is these scales, these things are going to come in. The economy is going to flip around. And it is going to be challenging for some, ple- some people in some places of the world where it's going to be harder to feed their families. But sin is going to abound them much more because that's going to be cheap. A man who can barely afford food but can afford a lot of booze can be dangerous. All right. Chapter 6, verse 7. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth creature saying, Come and look. I looked and behold, it says, I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. The power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, a quarter of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with beasts of the earth. So we go back and look at the pale horse. <clears throat> There's a cool western named Pale Rider. It's pretty much named after this. But it's not pale as in like we would think pale white or anything like that. And some uh, versions it just says ashen. But if you look it up, it's actually if you were to mix like green and yellow, kind of like in a pale green mix there, sickly would be the best way to describe it, a sickly horse. So this is not just a pale colored horse. He said pale But that word pale isn't just like, oh, the color. Again, John used the words he could to describe it. This is a sickly horse, a horse that, man, barely looks like it could be walking. Again, if you've seen Lord of the Rings, imagine like the horses that the the Nazgul, yeah, it has like nails in its hooves, and yeah, those things are brutal. But they're sickly, okay? So it says that he sat on a pale horse, yellow-green sickly, representing the death and sickness that comes with him. And now it's interesting here <clears throat> because he names the person sitting on it. And all the other ones doesn't name the person. Describes what they're going to do. But in this one, he names it. And he says, he that sat on him was death. Death is a spirit. 
and here he is given reign over a quarter of the earth. Quarter of the earth. To kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and the beasts of the air. So here it's actually not just saying, okay, death is going to come to a quarter of the people. It's actually saying the spirit of death will come out. The an- almost like the angel of death did in Pharaoh's day, taking the firstborn son. And it says that hell followed with him. That word hell is the word Hades. It's not the, the mythical god Hades, even though it shares the same name. It's actually describing the power of hell and tormenting spirits. So I'm going to just kind of like backtrack and just kind of describe what's happening. The Antichrist comes to power. And he says, hey, I'm going to be able to fix a lot of things. I'm going to unite a bunch of people, right? We're going to try to end war and all this kind of stuff, and we're going to, you know, don't make me come over there kind of attitude, right? Kind of trying to get everybody in line. And people are going to think Christ has returned. They're going to think that's Christ because Christ said he would come and bring order to the earth. Then this other person appears, which a lot of prophets believe could be a power either in Asia or potentially Russia, somewhere like that, because it's described as a red horse and they are a superpower that could have a leader who could take peace from the earth. Absolutely could take peace from the earth. And now with weapons of mass destruction, you could just threaten. You wouldn't actually have to launch them. We've seen that happen before, right? You just threaten to launch a nuke, and all of a sudden the world just stops for a second. So then this other guy comes and starts stirring up all this chaos and this war. And in the midst of all of that... All of a sudden, now the economies start shifting, and food starts becoming more expensive and scarce, and there's famine and all these things happening, right? But then things like booze and and other religious practices that aren't of God, those type of things become cheap and easy and accessible. It says in the end, they'll make merchandise of you, right? They find a way to just make all this other stuff cheap, and then the other things more expensive, right? Then death comes along. My interpretation of that is that the reason why so many people die is because of the war from the second, from the second horse and then the famine because of the third horse because food becomes so scarce. We have people starving today. And the sad thing is there are multiple religious organizations that have the ability to end it. The Catholic Church has billions in gold in their, in their chambers. When Mandy and I went to Europe, we went to, we went to Rome, and we checked out the Vatican. And while that stuff is beautiful and wonderful to look at, if I had to choose between a gold statue of, you know, some Peter or some other apostle that they tried to memorialize, or a starving village in Africa, or some other country where they can't get the food, there's no way to grow crops, I would absolutely choose them over the statue. But see, that religion is so bound up in remembering, so bound up in having the power and the control, they think that they're protecting history. And they are. But I'm sorry, lives are more important than history. There's only one history I care about, and it's right here in the written word of God. Okay? That's the only one I care about. I don't care about the statues. They were beautiful to look at. I loved looking at the Sistine Chapel. Wonderful. Beautiful. But they, they could sell all of that stuff and solve so many problems in the world, but they don't. And we didn't even see the good stuff. One of the guys told us, he's like, oh yeah, there's the, the size of the Vatican, there's like a whole underground chamber where they keep all like their gold and stuff like that. I mean, there are, there are different, uh, different uh, places where, with Catholicism, every time they collect an offering, a portion of it goes back to Rome. They're just continuing to make money off of all these other churches which is why the Pope lives in such a lush, wonderful, comfortable environment. I'm not saying you shouldn't be comfortable. I'm just saying when you have that much power and you have that much wealth, you have that much more responsibility. Yes, you do. So, so the reason why I bring that up is because as you go through these things, don't, don't necessarily think of when it comes to the pale horse as necessarily a physical person. Because he names him death and death is a spirit, that can take life away from man, this is not going to be a physical person on the earth. It says he doesn't kill them. They're killed by what? The sword, hunger, by death, which is when in that connotation it's old age, and by the beasts of the earth. And he wipes out a quarter of the population. World War II was a disaster, and we lost so many lives. 
but a war that could take out a quarter of the earth between hunger and the actual war itself, that's pretty crazy to think about. All right. So now, chapter 6, verse 9, says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. He's talking about the martyrs here. And for their testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? So here, something happens in heaven. This is not something we're going to see. We're going to be able to tell the Antichrist because he's going to start doing things and moving things together where it's going to seem like it's for good. But the tree of good and evil are the same tree. It's not the same as the tree of life, right? So the Antichrist you're going to be able to see. This other red horse that he describes that takes peace from the earth, we're going to know when that happens, right? And we've already seen bits and pieces of the way the economy can shift and fluctuate, right? It's not, uh, it's not crazy to think that stock market could crash or other things could happen. So those are all things that we're able to witness. A quarter of the population is going to die. That's not going to be something you're going to miss. Be like, oh, yeah, I wasn't on Yahoo or CNN. I didn't see that. You're going to know when those things happen. But this fifth seal <clears throat> um, actually is something that we're not going to witness. This is something that happens in heaven. And so here you have these martyrs who have all been killed for the name of God, God for preaching the testimony of Christ. And they were slain, and they're telling Jesus. They're saying, how long are you going to wait? It's like us down here. Every time I read a story about human trafficking or child abuse or things that happen in other countries, it tears me up inside, and I say, how long are you going to wait to judge these people? But that's just me thinking in my head. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. I don't see everything that's happening. We get some insight in verse 11. It says, in white robes, that word white is the actual luminous white, remember? The, pale ho or the uh, white horse described to the Antichrist was slightly off. This word white is like a shining, shimmering pearl. White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season, that word little, short season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren would be killed just as they were. Jesus is saying, I don't, it's not that I don't want to judge. It's that it's not done yet. There's still more to be saved. There's still more martyrs to come. It's not the end yet, right? So, all these martyrs kind of just jump the gun a little bit, like, okay, God, come on, like, quarter of the population's gone, these people are in power, I was martyred for your name, and, and he says, I trust you, he says, holy and true, like, not to step on your toes, but if you could speed this up, it would be great, because there's a lot of things wrong on the earth, and Jesus is just telling them, just wait a short season, there's going to be more to come, and more to join, and it's not the end yet. All right. Now we get to the sixth seal. And every time I read this, I still think about the movie 2012, which was a horrible movie, but had some cool animation in it. Um, verse 12, chapter 6, verse 12. I looked and he broke the sixth seal. And there was a great, that word great meaning terrible again, terrible earthquake. The sun became black as a sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a mighty wind. All right. So I put some pictures up there, not to scare you all, but just to kind of like provide context. Earthquakes happen all the time, right? And being in California, we've encountered many, multiple and we've always been told that California is going to break off and like float off into the ocean, which it wouldn't float. It would just submerge. You know, continents don't float. They're attached to the ocean floor. Um, so, but it says a great earthquake. This is a significant, terrible earthquake. And all this time, what you should be thinking is, how in the world are people who don't believe in God still not going to believe? Up until now, you have wars and death and famine all over the world. It's completely messed up, and you're still going to have people that are going to be like, nah, 
just like they said, nothing's changed. I'm sorry, a lot has changed. But they're going to say, nothing's changed. Or they're going to put their faith in the wrong person. They're going to put their faith in a man here on earth instead of their faith toward God, who's really the one who knows everything that's happening here. So we're going to go through this. So real quick, so it says the great terrible earthquake, and it says the sun become black like a sackcloth of hair. <clears throat> We've all seen the solar eclipses, right? They happen every so often, and they're pretty enjoyable to watch, right? But in this instance, he describes all of these things, and the way he describes them, they all happen within a very short amount of time. We've all seen, have anybody seen blood moons? Okay, a little fact for you. Uh, let's see, from 1582 to 1909, there were no tetrads. What a tetrad is, is where four blood moons occur. It's two blood moons, an eclipse, and then two more blood moons. It's called a tetrad. Um, so up until 1909, there were none of them. It just didn't happen. From 1910 to 1999, there were four tetrads, which is pretty crazy. From 2000 to 2032, there will be 10 tetrads. So this is a natural phenomenon that science describes as the red light for the moon, for, from the sun passes through the Earth's atmosphere and makes the moon look red because the moon's on the other side of the Earth in this instance. And so the red light is the only thing that gets through, which makes the moon look red. The problem is, if it's something that should be happening on a regular basis, why didn't it happen until 19, 1910 when the first one happened. And then all of a sudden they started becoming more predominant. And now we're going to have 10. It's 2019. We're going to have 10 in the next 13 years. Now, we've all also seen meteor showers. In fact, they happen pretty much on a regular basis. You can go online and say, hey, when's the next meteor shower? It's going to tell you a date and a time that you can look up at the sky and see those meteor showers. Because as the Earth is orbiting the sun, it hits pretty much the same old debris over and over again. And so it looks really cool. You're like, awesome, you know, and you see these meteor showers. But here, he describes it differently. He says, the stars of the sky fell to the Earth. Okay. Meteor showers don't really hit Earth. They burn up in the atmosphere. That's why they look so cool and pretty. Right? But they don't actually fall to the Earth. Here it's saying they fall to the earth. And then on top of it, it is saying, uh, as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a mighty wind. It means that we're going to see meteor showers not when they're supposed to happen. You see, science has, a, has an explanation for blood moons, and they have an explanation for meteor showers, and they try to predict when they're going to happen. But the fact that blood moons are suddenly popping up more and more frequently and actually quadrupled, basically, in the last hundred years, suddenly we're just having all these blood moons, leads us to believe that something is happening. Something is changing. And then for us to say, that, hey, we, see, we know when all these meteor showers are going to happen, but then all of a sudden tomorrow you wake up and there's a meteor shower in the day. And then the news goes, oh, crud. Uh, yeah, there's a meteor shower. Yeah, sorry, we forgot. Right? They're going to somehow try to claim that they found a way to justify it, but they think they already know when they're going to happen. This is saying an unripe fig, which means it wasn't, it wasn't its time. So when you see in the news, surprise meteor shower, guess what? That's the sixth seal. Well, honestly, I think the earthquake will get your attention before the meteor shower. <laughs> Hopefully the earthquake gets your attention first. So the earthquake, the sun becomes black sackcloth, which is, again, in the middle of a tetrad, we see that happen. And then the whole moon becomes like blood, which is a blood moon. It says, The sky will split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island moved from its place. Verse 15 says, Then the king of the earth, the great men and commanders, the rich and the strong, and every slave and free man, hid themselves in caves and among rocks among the mountains. And they said, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. This is an important scripture because all the while, while this is happening, we are here. Okay? We know this is happening, and we're going to be sitting there telling people this is happening. And that Jesus is coming back. And that this is all means to an end. Because here in the scripture, 
They're saying to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from who? By, hide us from him who sits on the throne. Their hearts are getting hardened during this time. And God's trying to get their attention, right? The earth is groaning and travailing, saying, Jesus is coming back. You guys need to wake up and stop living your reckless, crazy lives and get your focus on him. And instead of doing that, they hide in the mountains. And they try to hide their face from God because they don't want to face the judgment. That means they know. That means these people know that Jesus is coming back and they're just rejecting him still. So for the people that are like, oh gosh, that sounds really harsh, and what if they never knew God? Judgment is not coming for people who don't know. Judgment is coming for the people who know and hide their face. The people who know that Jesus is coming back and then still reject him and still say no and harden their hearts. That's why we're not here for the plagues, which is great. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Now, um, that takes you all the way through chapter 6. Chapter 7 goes into the ceiling, and it talks about the ceiling of 144,000 saints, and then talks about a multitude of those who lived through the tribulation. I'm not going to cover that today, but I want to acknowledge it just so you know. We are moving past chapter 7 to chapter 8 to get to the last seal. All that purpose serves is, there are going to be those who are sealed on the earth as messengers for God to be able to try to still save people. And then John gets taken up and he gets to see all the people who lived through the tribulation and the multitude. And he said, the number I couldn't even count. So see, sometimes people read the Bible and they go, 144,000 sealed. Hopefully I got that lottery number. That is not the case. The 144 were sealed for a specific purpose. But John says he saw a multitude, a number he could not count. I don't know how you count to 144,000, but here was a number he could not count to, and that was all those who were redeemed and lived through the great, he calls it the great tribulation. Because the Christians had tribulation in John's day, but it wasn't the great tribulation. He makes a distinction between what his life was, what the disciples' lives were, there was tribulation. Jesus said, you'll have trials and tribulations, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world, right? He tells them that because you're going to have it. But the great tribulation, the terrible tribulation, he draws a distinction from. So, if you'll go with me to Revelation chapter 8. I may go back and talk about 7 a little bit more, but you should read it, and then we can talk about it. Um, Invite me out for coffee or something. I don't drink coffee, so invite me out for a burger. Um... Chapter 8, verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Remember I told you heaven never stops, never ceases. The worship is always going. For 30 minutes, heaven stops. That's crazy. Imagine what that's going to be like while you're here on the earth and just heaven itself. We are blessed daily, and when we worship God and we encounter his spirit and and we're communing and trying to bring heaven down, right? So heaven is always going. There's always something happening. Could you imagine what that's going to feel like when you're praying and it's silent in heaven? And he says, I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. The seventh seal marks the end of the seals on the book, so now Jesus, it can open up, right? Now he's able to say, now he's able to read the contents. I, Jesus, Son of God, am able to inherit the, whatever it says in there, I don't know. But whatever it says in there, he's now able to read. And the moment he signs his name at the bottom of that, That's that seventh trumpet, and Jesus is pronounced that he is king of the earth. And then all at once we're taken up. But trumpets are for later. All right. Now, one thing I learned as I was going through this again was I was like, man, it's really crazy that John encountered all of this and the way that he saw it. And I was like thinking to myself, I wonder if there was anywhere else that this came up. Because a lot of times people say it's metaphorical or it's a poem or whatever. It's not because you can actually find a lot of the stuff we just covered in Matthew. 
So if you turn to Matthew chapter 24. So a lot of people are like, end times in Matthew? He was just hitting his stride. They had just marketed his water bottle. <laughs> his little live strong, you know, WWJD thing just caught on. And he's already talking about the end times. All right. All right, so Matthew chapter 24. And if you start at verse 1, and it kind of breaks up in time, but I'll go through it. So Jesus comes out of the temple, and the disciples are chasing him down. And they're like, Jesus, Jesus, look at this temple you just came out of. They're saying they're marveling at the temple and the building itself. And then Jesus says to them, do you not see all things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be here left upon another, which will not be torn down. He's basically saying, you guys are marveling at this building that when I come back in rain, it's not even going to be here. See, disciples were so focused on what they saw and how beautiful it looked. And when we were in the Vatican, man, it was beautiful. But I sat there thinking the whole time, who built this? Were they slave or free? Right? Think about all the money that's in here. Where's all that money going? Where's all, where's all these expensive statues and tapestries and things that, that could be sold or melted down to pay for tons of food and medical supplies and treatments for other people. See, sometimes people go and they marvel at things because they look so great and they're so beautiful, but they don't think about what it costs, right? And that temple, while it was beautiful and marvelous, someone had to build it. And God, uh, Jesus already knew that that temple, that was a religious sanctum. That wasn't, that wasn't the church, See, we've got to get out of this mindset that the church is this building. We have to pay for this building so we have a place to come together and worship and preach. But this building is not the church. We are the church. We should be taking what we know and what we've learned out of this building and then preaching to other people and telling them the things we know. So he's telling them, don't focus on this building. It's going to be torn down. It won't even be here when I come. Not one stone will be on top of its original place. It'll be gone. So then a while later, because you see in chapter th- or in verse 3, chapter 24, verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount Olives, so it's not like he just instantly teleported, like time had passed, he was sitting on the Mount Olives, and the disciples came to him privately. So they didn't do this publicly. Probably to save face. Like they had been close to Jesus for a long time. They're probably like, hey, Jesus, when's all that going to take place? Because... Like, uh, Tom over there was asking, and I would tell him, but you tell it better. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it says privately. I think that was funny. I was just like, privately, you know? Um, but it's not supposed to be something that's hidden. But he said, they said, tell us when will these things happen, and what will the sign be of your coming and the end of the age? So, Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus answered to them and answered to them and said, See to it that no man misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and I will mis- and will mislead many. You will be and so he starts off right off the bat talking about deception in the church. Just like the Antichrist. Starts right off the bat with talking through, be careful, because there's going to be people coming and they're going to Look at this guy. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's like, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. All right. And then if you go on to verse 6 and 7, it says, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place. But that doesn't mean that it's the end. Wars and rumors of wars. Boom. Red horse in Revelations. Already talks about it. Uh, Verse 7 says, For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And, in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. Already describing and talking about everything that's going on. And then verse 9, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and hate one another. He's basically describing it already to Matthew. So this is Matthew writing here. 
This is long before Revelation, and he's already revealing the things that are going to come. What I learned about this is Jesus never hides anything from us. It's not like that message was only meant for John. John got it, but guess what? So did Matthew, because it's right here in his. Matthew wrote this whole book about his experience with Christ, and here before Christ is killed, he gets, a revel- he gets the revelation of when all these things will happen. And why? Because he asked. They said, when will these things take place? Now, I think this is important because I was, um, I was watching another uh, uh, ministry, this guy, Ravi Zachariah, who's like, he's really, really good. He came from the Middle East and converted to Christianity. But he has a lot to say about the, the uh, persecution of the Christian church because he was on the other side of it. He was the persecutor. And he said, ironically, there's so many religions out there that are exclusive, that preach that their God is the God you serve, that there is one way to go, and it's this way, and the rest of the world is fine with all those other religions. But Christianity gets hit the hardest out of all of them. Out of all of them. You could be Jewish, and you're not going to get hit nearly as hard. The Jewish people don't believe that Christ was the Messiah. They basically stop right there after uh, the last book of the Old Testament. They're like, that's it. They believe Jesus was a prophet, or a prophet, like an apostle, but they don't believe he was the Messiah. They don't believe that he rose again, and so that's why they're still crying at the Wailing Wall. But you can be a Jewish person, person and be able to have time to pray in school or do anything you want, and you won't be judged. But if you're a Christian and you do that, all of a sudden now you're, you're marked or you're denied that ability to do those things. And he said it's ironic because it is, even though people see it as exclusive, he's like, so is it almost every other religion. But all those other religions are given grace because it's a religious belief. But Christianity, for some reason, is targeted. And he said it best. He said it's because it's the only one that the enemy fears. Right. The enemy doesn't fear other religions if he knows they go nowhere. He doesn't fear religions that tell you you'll be reincarnated. And there's two different types of religions that believe in reincarnation. One that you carry your essence over to the next creature, and the other one that you just become the other creature. So one believes that that dung beetle could be your aunt, and her essence is in that dung beetle. And then the other believes that she is just a dung beetle, and her, her conscience is gone. And those people are very accepting of. But then when you try to tell people that Jesus is Lord and that he came to save them and that he is the only way that you can enter the kingdom of God, people say, gosh, well, that just doesn't seem right. (laughs) It doesn't make sense to me. I seriously, I struggle with it. I would love someone to be able to explain to me why other religions are given free reign to have their beliefs and be exclusive and be okay, but Christianity is not. But here in Matthew, he, he explains it. And he says, you're going to be hated of all nations. For my name's sake. And I believe that specifically speaks to in Revelation when it talks about the coexist. How many know I would love to take the cross out of that coexist slogan? It doesn't belong there. If you want to put all those other religions together and say, can't we all just get along? Go for it. But I love people too much and I have such a fervent belief that Jesus Christ is Lord that I'm not going to, I would not want the T of coexist to be a cross. Make it something else. And it says you'll be hated of all nations. That's okay. Uh, that's, that's really okay because I love people too much. And if they hate me, that's okay. I don't fear them. I would rather them know the truth. And then on that day of judgment, when things happen, they won't look to me and say, Kevin, why didn't you? Instead, they'll say, Kevin, I'm sorry I didn't listen. Not that I want to be right. I would rather them have listened down here. But... We should be taking that soberly, that the information you've been given, the gift of God and the Spirit of God that dwells within you, it's not for you, yours to keep. You should not be choosing who and how and when to give that out. It's God's will. You should be sharing it out. So if you have friends or loved ones that you're holding back because you're like, ah, I don't want to offend them. Sorry. At times, if Christianity is offensive then it's probably because of something in their life that's offending God. There's multiple times where Christ did things that you could absolutely say was offensive, 
when he called different teachers in the temple pots full of vomit. Right? Shiny on the outside, full of absolutely nothing but bile on the inside. Brood of vipers. Those were things that were absolutely offensive. But let me tell you, they were things because he, he knew their hearts and he was trying to break them out of what they were in, this religious cycle. All right. And then Matthew twenty four twelve and 3 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure till the end, the same shall be saved. That word endure is the Greek word 5278, hupomino, which means to persevere through trials, hold fast to one's faith in Christ, even unto martyrdom. So talking about the martyrs, remember, it says, John said when he saw that that fifth seal had got torn open, that there were all those martyrs crying out, when are you going to judge? When are you going to judge? And Jesus said, you're not all here yet. You're not all in attendance. Wait. So Matthew 24, 12, and 3 is talking about that. He that endureth till the end, even unto martyrdom, the same shall be saved. And then if you skip down, Matthew 24, verse 29 says, Immediately after those days, sun shall be darkened, and the moon and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Jesus is revealing everything that's happening at the end of time to his disciples. And then Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31 says, And then shall appear the sign, the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather to, together his elect, his elect is you and me, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. He's coming back. We sang about it this morning. There are signs that you will see. Revelation is a book that you're supposed to be able to read and understand. When you see those things, the Bible says, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. When you see those signs. So, good, perfect. I was able to get through all seven seals. Um, we're all going to pray for Scott's chargers? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I remembered you. I told him I told him if he was able to come to church and offer it up on the altar of sacrifice that the Lord would give it back to him. So we're we're praying for a win for him. Um no, but it's important to know those seals. Those seals usher in a preparation. Just like when you harvest, you till the ground. If you went out into a field and just put a seed in the ground, it might grow, it might not. There might be weeds, there may be rocks, maybe the rock below, the root doesn't, take, doesn't go deep enough. All of a sudden it can't get water and dies. So before you plant and before you harvest, you have to till the ground. Right. And those seven seals are the earth shaking, things happening. Not that God's doing it, things are happening on the earth. And so that's the time that we should be focused. Daniel's son, focus. <laughs> Karate here and here, never here. I just watched Karate Kid with my kids. They loved it. <laughs> Cooper can now do wax on, wax off. It's pretty cool. There's so many things you can get from movies. Um, but in that same sense, seriously, we, our focus should be, this should not be the time that we're questioning, you know, whether or not we believe in God, whether or not what I experienced was true, Right? Sometimes we have things that happen in our life, whether it's deliverance, whether it's being saved, whether it's the gift of the Holy Spirit, and, and you would think, I'll never doubt this. But you'd be surprised two or three years from now, all of a sudden, that doubt tries to creep its way back in. This is the time to be focused because all these things are going to unfold. We're going to have more blood moons before 2032 than we had pretty much any other time before 1909 when there was none. We didn't have any of those. It's incredible to think that those things are escalating and those things are happening and that during that time, we're going to have lots of people justify it and say it's this or it's that or it's global warming or it's because of those things. And I do believe the earth is changing. Shoot, it was so cold here. I don't remember it ever getting down to like 28 degrees in Ramona. 
But I got 28 degrees, just like I never remember to get into 115 over the summer, but it did. <clears throat> I'm not doubting that things are changing. The difference between me and somebody else is I know why they're changing, and I know what they're preparing, and I know that because those things are happening, I can have hope that I'm going to see my Lord and Savior soon. All right? That's all I have to say about that.